in 2020usaidgovernor slash news information slash press releases slash nov 26 2018 administrator Mark Green interview Xpan Newsmakers, accessed March 17, 2023. For U.S. Agency for International Development, Digital Strategy 2020 2024. HTTPS slash slash www.usaid.gov slash site slash default slash file slash 2022 05 slash USAID underscore digital underscore strategy dot PDF dot PDF slash slash www.usaid.gov slash digital development slash USAID digital strategy, accessed March 17, 2023. 5U.S. Strategic Framework for the Indo Pacific, declassified in part by Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs Robert C. O'Brien, January 5, 2021. HTTPS slash slash Trump White House dot archives dot gov slash WP content slash upload slash 2021 slash 01 slash IPS final D class dot PDF, accessed March 18th, 2023, and Robert C. O'Brien, Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, a free and open Indo Pacific, January 5th, 2021. HTTPS slash slash Trump White House dot archives dot gov slash WP content slash upload slash 2021 slash 01 slash O'Brien expanded. Statement dot PDF accessed March 18, 2023. 6 News Release, Fact Sheet, Prioritizing Climate and Foreign Policy and National Security, The White House, October 21, 2021, https slash slash www.whitehouse.gov slash briefing room slash statements releases slash 2021 slash 10 slash 21 slash fact sheet prioritizing climate and foreign policy and national security slash, accessed January 28, 2023. 7 U.S. Agency for International Development, Climate Strategy 2020-2030, April 2022, https//www.usaid.gov slash site slash default slash file slash 2022-11 USAID Climate Strategy 2022-2030.pdf, accessed March 18, 2023. 8. Adva Saldinger, USAID Steps Up Languishing Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Effort, devx.com, December 15, 2021. HTTP colon slash slash www.devx.com slash news slash USAID hyphen steps hyphen up hyphen languishing hyphen diversity hyphen equity hyphen and hyphen inclusion hyphen effort hyphen 102316, accessed January 28, 2021. 9 U.S. Agency for International Development, Gender Equity and Women Empowerment, HTTPS slash slash www.usaid.gov slash gender equality and women's empowerment, accessed January 30, 2023. 10 U.S. Agency for International Development, Integrating Gender Equality and Female Empowerment in USAID's Program Cycle, ADS Chapter 25, Partial Revision Date January 22, 2021, HTTPS slash slash www.usaid.gov slash site slash default slash file slash 2022 12 slash 205.pdf, accessed March 18, 2023. 11 S 137, Protecting Life and Foreign Assistance Act, 117th Congress, Introduced January 28, 2021, https slash slash www.congress.gov slash bill slash 117th Congress slash Senate bill slash 137 number colon text equals protecting percent 20 life percent 20 in percent 20 foreign percent 20 assistance percent 20 act percent 20 this percent 20 bill support percent 24 percent 20 in percent 20 entity percent 20 that percent 20 conducts percent 20 such percent 20 activities, access January 20, 2023, and HR 534. Protecting Life and Foreign Assistance Act, 117th Congress, introduced January 28, 2021, https slash slash www.congress.gov slash bill slash 117th Congress slash House Bill slash 534, S equals 1 and R equals 450, accessed January 20, 2023. 12. President Joseph R. Biden Jr., Memorandum on Protecting Women's Health at Home and Abroad, Memorandum for the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development, the White House, January 28, 2021, https slash slash www.whitehouse.gov slash briefing room slash presidential action slash 2021 slash 01 slash 28 slash memorandum on protecting women's health at home and abroad slash, accessed March 18, 2023. 13 President Donald J. Trump, Executive Order 13926, Advancing International Religious Freedom, June 2, 2020, in Federal Register, Volume 85, Number 109, June 5, 2020, pages 34,951-34,953, HTTPS slash slash www.govinfo.gov slash content slash package slash fr 2020-06-05 slash pdf slash 2020-12430.pdf, 
Access January 20, 2023. 1422 Code of Federal Regulations 205.1, https slash slash www.ecford.gov slash current slash title 22 slash chapter 2 slash part 205, accessed March 18, 2023. 15 Contributors Notes from Internal USAID Meetings. 16 President Donald J. Trump, Executive Order 13957, Creating Schedule F in the Accepted Service, October 21, 2020, in Federal Register, Volume 85. Number 207, October 26, 2020, pages 67,631, 67,635, https slash slash www.govinfo.gov slash content slash package slash fr 2020-10-26 slash pdf slash 2020-23780.pdf, accessed March 18, 2023. 17 Prosper Africa, Increasing Trade and Investment Between the U.S. and African Countries. HTTPS slash slash www.prosperafrica.gov slash, accessed March 18, 2023. 18 HR 434, Trade and Development Act of 2000, Public Law 106-200, 106th Congress, May 18, 2000, Title I, Subtitle A, HTTPS slash slash agoa.info slash images slash documents slash 2385 slash agoa underscore legal underscore text dot pdf, accessed March 18, 2023. Warning, Empty Page Section 3. The General Welfare When our founders wrote in the Constitution that the federal government would promote the general welfare, they could not have fathomed a massive bureaucracy that would someday spend $3 trillion in a single year roughly the sum, combined, spent by the departments covered in this section in 2022. Approximately half of that colossal sum was spent by the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, alone the belly of the massive behemoth that is the modern administrative state. HHS is home to Medicare and Medicaid, the principal drivers of our $31 trillion national debt. When Congress passed and President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law these programs, they were set on autopilot with no plan for how to pay for them. The first year that Medicare spending was visible on the books was 1967. From that point on through 2020 according to the American Main Street Initiatives. Analysis of official federal tallies Medicare and Medicaid combined cost $17.8 trillion, while our combined federal deficits over that same span were $17.9 trillion. In essence, our deficit problem is a Medicare and Medicaid problem. HHS is also home to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and the National Institutes of Health, NIH, the duo most responsible along with President Joe Biden for the irrational, destructive, un-American mask and vaccine mandates that were imposed upon an ostensibly free people during the COVID-19 pandemic. All along, it was clear from randomized controlled trials the gold standard of medical research that masks provide little to no benefit in preventing the spread of viruses and might even be counterproductive. Yet the CDC ignored these high-quality RCTs, cherry-picked from politically malleable observational studies, and declared that everyone except children and infants below the age of two should don masks. Under COVID, as former director of HHS's Office of Civil Rights Roger Severino writes in Chapter 14, the CDC exposed itself as perhaps the most incompetent and arrogant agency in the federal government. Nor is the CDC the only villain in this play. Severino writes of the National Institutes of Health, despite its popular image as a benign science agency, NIH was responsible for paying for research in aborted baby body parts, human-animal chimera experiments in which the genes of humans and animals are mixed, and gain-of-function viral research that may have been responsible for COVID-19. Severino writes that Anthony Fossey's division of the NIH the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases owns half the patent for the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, and several NIH employees receive up to $150,000 annually from Moderna vaccine sales. That would be the same experimental mRNA vaccine that the CDC now wants to force on children, who are at little to no risk from COVID-19 but at great risk from public health officials. The incestuous relationship between the NIH, CDC, and vaccine makers with all of the conflict of interest it entails cannot be allowed to continue, and the revolving door between them must be locked. As Severino writes, funding for scientific research should not be controlled by a small group of highly paid and unaccountable insiders at the NIH, many of whom stay in power for decades. The NIH monopoly on directing research should be broken. What's more, NIH has long been at the forefront in pushing junk gender science. The next HHS secretary should immediately put an end to the department's foray into woke transgender activism. HHS also pushes abortion as a form of health care, skirting and sometimes blatantly defying the Hyde Amendment in the process. Severino writes that the FDA should reverse its approval of chemical abortion drugs because the politicized approval process was illegal from the start. In addition, HHS programs often violate the spirit, and sometimes the letter, of conscience protection laws. Severino writes that the HHS secretary should pursue a robust agenda to protect 
the fundamental right to life, protect conscience rights, and uphold bodily integrity rooted in biological realities, not ideology. The next secretary should also reverse the Biden administration's focus on LGBTQ and equity, subsidizing single motherhood, disincentivizing work, and penalizing marriage, replacing such policies with those encouraging marriage, work, motherhood, fatherhood, and nuclear families. If there is another department that has gone off the rails like HHS during the Obama and Biden administrations, it is the once proud Department of Justice, DOJ. As former counselor to the Attorney General Gene Hamilton writes in Chapter 17, the department has a long and noble history. Edmund Randolph, the first Attorney General, took office the same year as President Washington yet its long-standing reputation has been marred by the Biden administration's abuse of the department's powers for its own ends. Hamilton writes that the department's unprecedented politicization and weaponization under Biden and Attorney General Merrick Garland, resulting in politically motivated and viewpoint-based prosecutions of political enemies and indifference to the crimes of political allies, has made the department a threat to the republic. The most important thing for the next attorney general to do is to refocus the department on its core functions of protecting public safety and defending the rule of law, while restoring its values of independence, impartiality, honesty, integrity, respect, and excellence. This is especially true of the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI. A bloated, arrogant, increasingly lawless organization, especially at the top, the FBI views itself as an independent agency that is on PAR with the Attorney General, rather than as an agency that is under the AG and fully accountable to him or her. To reign in this completely out-of-control bureau and remind it of its place within rather than at the top of the DOJ hierarchy, Hamilton writes that the FBI's separate office of general counsel, with approximately 300 attorneys, separate office of legislative affairs, and separate office of public affairs should all be abolished. Requiring the FBI to get its legal advice from the wider department would serve as a crucial check on an agency that has recently pushed past legal boundary after legal boundary. Indeed, Hamilton writes, T. He next conservative administration should eliminate any offices within the FBI that it has the power to eliminate without any action from Congress. Elsewhere, DOJ should target violent and career criminals, not parents, work to dismantle criminal organizations, partly by rigorously prosecuting interstate drug activity, and restart the Trump administration's China initiative to address Chinese espionage and theft of trade secrets, which the Biden administration terminated. Largely out of a concern for poor optics. It should also enforce existing federal law that prohibits mailing abortifacients, rather than harassing pro-life demonstrators, respect the constitutional guarantee of the freedom of speech, rather than trying to police speech on the Internet, and enforce federal immigration laws, rather than pretending there is no border. In contrast to DOJ's long history, the Department of Education, the Department, or Ed, discussed by Lindsay Burke in Chapter 11, is a creation of the Jimmy Carter administration. The department is a convenient one-stop shop for the woke education cartel, which as the COVID era showed is not particularly concerned with children's education. Schools should be responsive to parents, rather than to leftist advocates intent on indoctrination and the more the federal government is involved in education, the less responsive to parents the public schools will be. This department is an example of federal intrusion into a traditionally state and local realm. For the sake of American children, Congress should shutter it and return control of education to the states. Short of this, the Secretary of Education should insist that the department serve parents and American ideals, not advocates whose message is that children can choose their own sex, that America is systemically racist, that math itself is racist, and that Martin Luther King, Jr.'s ideal of a colorblind society should be rejected in favor of reinstating a color-conscious society. The next head of this department will have a lot to do hopefully culminating in the department's closure and the salutary restoration of educational control to states, localities, and parents. The next Secretary of Energy will similarly have much work to do. Under the next president, the Department of Energy should end the Biden administration's unprovoked war on fossil fuels, restore America's energy independence, oppose eyesore windmills built at taxpayer expense, and respect the right of Americans to buy and drive cars of their own choosing, rather than trying to force them into electric vehicles and eventually out of the driver's seat altogether in favor of self-driving robots. As former Commissioner of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Bernard L. McNamee says in Chapter 12, a conservative president must be committed to unleashing all of America's energy resources and making the energy economy serve the American people, not special interests. In Chapter 10, Darren Baxt writes that the Biden administration's Department of Agriculture claims to be transforming the food system as we know it. But the government does not need to transform the food system, instead, it should respect American farmers, truckers, and families. In Chapter 13, former Chief of Staff at the